Hi everyone and welcome to my video on Axie and Axie Lite. So in this video I'm going to be going through Axie in general and giving a brief introduction to Axie and why we use it and how it works and also get into some details on an example Axie Lite interface transaction. I'm choosing NC Lite as I'll explain a bit later because it is a good stepping stone to Axie. It has all the same principles as Axie but in a slightly more scaled down format. I am going to start by saying that it's not as bad as it looks. It looks scary because there's a ton of signals and they all have weird names and it's just like what the heck is going on but it's not that bad and actually when you break it up into components and I explain how the naming convention works it actually makes a lot of sense. So we have the Axie protocol spec in front of me. These are the diagrams that I ended my last video on. And so we're going to pick up here again. And if you haven't seen my Axie stream video, I recommend that you go watch it or another video on Axie stream that someone else has made. If you want to go watch someone else's content, I don't mind. Okay, <laughs> honestly, um, <laughs> I'm not mandating you watch my stuff necessarily. Go and educate yourself on Axie stream before you watch this. Otherwise you will be you know, very confused. So these are basically a bunch of little Axie stream interfaces. We've got five of them. These interfaces are what we use to together to make Axie. So we've got two stream interfaces to make the read channel. Well, the read interface and then three together to make the write interface. I'm going to explain the difference between Axie and Axie stream from like a practicality point of view. Axie stream is just a bunch of bits and I want to put them on a wire. When I'm using an Axie stream, I have no destination as such. It's just the destination is whatever's at the other end of the wire. Sending a bunch of bits down a wire and not really caring what goes on at the end, as long as the ready says it's ready. However, sometimes you want to write it into a memory address space. So say, for example, we're working with RAM, you're working with a CPU and the CPU has an address space. I want to send my data to a spot in memory over there. I'm going to say, I want this data to be there, please. And there are multiple destinations that I could send my data to. And I want to be able to pick and choose where I want it to go. And so I need to specify where that is. And I need to check that it got there happily. I start with the address and I say, I want that address, please. And then the response channel, the read data channel, the data comes along the stream interface back to me on the data channel. And so this way I can request for data over there in that specific spot in memory and it will give it to me. And I don't have that functionality with the stream interface on its own. So we've coupled two stream interfaces together here. And now with the right architecture, I want to put this data that I have over there. So the first thing I do is I write the address that I want to. So I'm like, I tell it this data that's coming, please put it in that spot in memory. Then I give the data. So I say, I'm going to be supplying you with this much data, this many words, word size is this, please. Can you put it over there? Thank you. And then the data comes and gets written. And then I want to know that they did their job correctly. I want to know that that CPU or whatever I'm talking to didn't freeze or get distracted. I want it to come back and tell me that it's done because I want to go on with my life or I want to do something else or I'm dependent on that, whatever. So then the CPU comes back to me and is all like, I'm done. We can go on with our lives. So that's why we have this write response channel is because I can't just send this into the void anymore like I did with the stream interface. I now want you to come back and tell me that you're done and we're good. So that's what this write response is. So we have more control over our data and where it goes and what it's doing on the other end. So now that we've gone over the top level view of what's going on here, I'm going to head into a few finer details. We're going to start with the naming convention. All of these channels are named with a prefix. So it's AR for address read, then R for read, and then AW for write, and then W for write, and B for response. So every channel has a prefix. Because it's a stream interface, you're going to have ready and valid. Read address is going to be AR ready, AR valid, and then read is R ready, R valid, and so on. So if we head over here, we can see our valid and our ready for every one of the channels. So this is, these are stream interfaces. So you have stream handshaking. We're expecting to see signal names that match Axie stream. And we do, instead of valid, we have AW valid for addressed write, write, 
response, read, and read data and address read. Uh, these are the Axie Lite signals. So I'm heading into Axie Lite first because Axie Lite is a nice way of learning the Axie protocol and the interface and the handshaking without getting bogged down by all the other signals that are on the interface. This is a pared down set of signals that also have limitations in other ways, but it's a nice way of easing into Axie. I'm going to point out what it, what is here and what is very obviously missing. And I encourage you to take a moment and just look at this. If you're familiar with Axie, I mean Axie Stream, what is glaringly obviously missing from this table of signals? And the answer is the last. There is no last here. There is no Axie last. There is a last in the data buses on the data buses for full Axie, but there are no lasts here at all. And the reason why is because every transaction is of length one as indicated down here, which means that for every one address, every address word, there is one data. And that is the limitation of Axie Lite. When you head into full Axie, you can send bursts of multiple data values for every one address value. And that is one of the limitations of Axie Lite. So Axie Lite is used often with register interfaces. If I want to write a value into a specific register value in memory or a specific register location, I can use Axie Lite. And that's what I'm going to be demonstrating here today. And that is why we have no last, because the last is implied high. So we have our valids for all the interfaces. We have our readies for all the interfaces. And then this line is the data. So sometimes the data is called address for the address channel. So that's the data and that's the data. So this is all data. This response is the data for the response channel. So we've got ready valid data. There is no last. And then there are a couple of additional signals. This read channel response is an additional data. It's the equivalent of the B response. And this just indicates to us that the read transaction went fine. Just like I was talking about the write response, this is the read response that comes back with the read data. And then these are protection uh, flags. So I'm not going to get hugely into protection today. It's uh, basically the CPU has parts of memory that are protected. There are secure parts of memory, memory spaces, and not secure memory spaces. And this is the way to indicate that you are working with a secure memory space. We're going to just be setting all of those to zero because we're not even interfacing with a processor today. And I think that the VDMA core, which is the DMA core that I'm going to be working with as an example, doesn't even have the single null on it. So it's not even always there. The right strobe is the only other one that is standing out in this table of signals. And that is a valid that's byte specific. So if I have 32 bit bus, the right strobe will be four bits. And that way I can indicate valid data on a byte by byte basis. So I can indicate that only two bytes on my four byte bus are valid. And so there is one bit per byte on the bus. And these are fairly common as you get into higher size bus widths. You know, if you have a 32 bit bus and you want to send transfers that are not a multiple of your bus size. So if you want to, you have a four byte bus and you want to send 30 bytes of data, you have a way of doing that without being forced to pad your data. You can just indicate your last two bytes are not valid. Uh, and that's what this right strobe is for which in this case, accommodating data that are smaller than the bus size. Let us look at just one of these transactions. So this is really easy. This is brushing up on Apsu stream. Every single one of these is exactly the same in that regard. It's just a single word written onto the Axie stream. The way I'm going to demonstrate this is I'm going to show you what my code looks like for the address write. Data valid ready and prot is fixed at zero. So this is my code for an Axie stream write that is one word, the data is one word long. In this case, that data happens to be an address. So in my case, my address is fixed at hex three zero. And so I write, where are we? When my write transaction starts, I set my valid high. If we quickly summarize the Axie stream rules, do not look at the ready when you want to drive the valid. 
you drive the valid on your own time. You don't look at what the ready is doing when you drive the valid. When the valid goes high, the data must remain the same the whole time. When the valid goes high, you cannot drop the valid again. The valid must stay high until the transaction is over. So I drive the valid high when I am ready to start the transaction. I do not include ready in this decision. Drive high. I And then in a separate if block, I check if the valid is high and the ready was also asserted then I know that the deassertion of valid, valid can occur. So the transaction is only complete when valid and ready are high at the same time. And it's only at that point after valid and ready have both been high at the same time that I can end the transaction and move on to the next word of data on the bus. There is no last because this was considered lost. Last is just always high and that's the end of that. It's really simple. So if we look at the simulation, this is what it looks like. So I wrote address 30 onto the data line or the address line. I drove my valid high for when I was ready. I didn't look at ready. I just drove valid high. I kept it like that until ready went high. At this point on this clock cycle, when valid and ready are both high at the same time, that's when my daughter is through on the bus and then I can be done. And then my state machine goes on to do other things. So this is me writing an address onto the address bus. So these three signals are this, this column here, write value valid, prot was driven to zero. And then this is this address. No, 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 this address channel that I've just done. So I've just done that. So now let's take a look at what the write data looks like. So here we have the write transaction. We've got the address right and the data right. Exactly the same thing, except I have the strobe um, the data is put on the data bus. The strobe is driven to be all high. The valid is driven high and we wait and we just hold it there. You can't deassert valid and you can't change the data until the ready goes high. So I just drive this high and I wait until that point. If we look at the code, here we go. Valid and high. When my transaction starts, I drive valid high. I drive strobe all high and I wait until ready is asserted. And at that point, when ready and valid are high, I can move on with my life. So notice a couple of things. The one thing that we notice is that if we look at this diagram here, you see how address and control and read, oh no, 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 address and control and write are offset from each other. In this case, they're not. In this case, I drove valid high for both the address and the data at the same time. I can drive these both at the same time and I can just let the slave pick up the readies when it's done. So you can see that the ready for the address was early on. The ready for the data was later because it was busy getting its act together. I don't know what it's doing during that time, but obviously it wasn't ready for the data until there. So, but I have to be patient. I have to wait until it's ready. So we've done the address, we've done the data. And so I am writing the value of three into register hex three zero. And then I'm writing a value of 280 into A4. And so now I am able to write a value into a specific a register in memory. So I can pick up the B signals. So the B is really easy as a master because all you do is just drive ready high the whole time. Um, and that's what I do. So let me just rerun. So I just drive ready the whole time. And then when the, when the response comes back, I check that it's zero. Zero means all is good. The rule is that the slave can't respond with B valid and a response until the write and the address are done. So it can't come and do a B response somewhere here. That's not allowed. Address and valid need to be done and then can it only respond because otherwise you're not done yet. Like you're obviously not done. You can't come back and say you're done when you haven't even got your data for the transaction yet. And then that's the end of the transaction. That's basically an Axie write transaction done. So let's demo the reads. I'm going to do three writes into three different addresses and then I will do the reads as well. So let me just pick up the read signals. So these are my read transactions in exactly the same way. I drive address and prot which is just zero on the bus with valid. And I just wait. So um, I'm going to be waiting for it to respond with ready. And then I know I'm done and then I can move on. And then the same on the read, 
I just drive really high and then it will give me the data back. The rule on the read is you can't get a read response without the address being written. It's kind of obvious. You can't give your data back if it doesn't know where it's supposed to be getting the data from. So you could only get a read valid once your address is, is driven on the bus. So once I do the address, then ready is driven high. I'm always ready for data. So my ready is just always driven high. And when the valid is done, then we have the data on the bus and I can see that the response is zero, which means we're good. And that's the full Axie transaction. That's an Axie read and Axie write on the Axie, Axie light bus. You see what I mean? It's not that bad. Another point that I will make here is that say, for example, we've got this weird prot signal that's driven to zero at the moment. This prot signal does not take part in the handshaking. The only signals that drive the handshaking are the ready and the valid. The prot signal just goes along with the data. It's exactly the same as like another data signal. It's valid at this point on the bus and that's all that matters. It doesn't participate in the handshaking. It's just an extra signal that gets carried along on the interface with the data. So when you get into big axi and there's like all of those extra signals, there's like QoS and region and IDs and lengths and sizes. It's like a lot of extra signals on the axi bus. All of those signals, as far as I can remember, all just travel along with the data. The core handshaking mechanic is your valid and ready stream handshake and also the rules between the channels. So you have the basic AXI rules, which are don't look at ready when driving valid, don't deassert valid, and keep the data on the data for as long as valid is high. And you can only deassert valid when you've got your ready. Those are the core AXI stream mechanics. Then the additional AXI rules are slave can't respond with responses until the address and the data. So for the write, the address and the data have to come through before the B response. And on the read, the address has to come through before the B response. And those are the, the AXI rules for the interactions between these stream interfaces. I think I'm going to be calling it a video for now. I will be going through the entire state machine in my next video, just because this one's getting a bit long and there will be people who just want to see the code and not <laughs> hear all of the long detailed explanation. So I'll put that in a separate video. Thanks very much. And I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.